we will be discussing how to get involved in research at any point in your career, including trainees, junior investigators, mid-career investigators, and even senior members. I should mention that this is an encore performance from a seminar at the 2017 Child Neurology Society annual meeting with some updates. Our guest speakers are Courtney Wusthoff from Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford and Mustafa Simheen from Boston Children's Hospital. First, a few technical notes about the webinar. This session is being recorded and will be transcribed and archived on the NINDS website. Details about where to find the archived version will be posted on social media and professional society listservs and newsletters. We will have a question and answer segment at the end. To ask a question of our presenters, you can either click on the ellipsis, that's the three little dots near the bottom of your screen, and click on Q&A, or you can open the participant window and on the bottom right, find the Q&A area. To repeat, if you have questions for our presenters, please either click on the ellipsis near the bottom of your screen and click on Q&A, or open the participant window on the bottom right, find the Q&A area. I will moderate the question period. A special thanks to Tim Leiden from NINDS for the technical support and coordination of the webinar and the office, the NINDS Office of the Scientific Liaison for all of its support and publicity. So let's get started. Our first speaker is Dr. Courtney Wusthoff, an Associate Professor of Neurology and Pediatrics at Stanford University. She is the Neurology Director for the Neonatal Neuro ICU at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and the Director of Neurocritical Care. Dr. Wusthoff's clinical and research interests include neonatal and pediatric seizures and brain monitoring. Her work addresses the use of EEG to understand brain injury and critical illness, neurodevelopmental outcomes after seizures, and neonatal neuroprotection. Dr. Wusthoff collaborates through a number of multi-center networks and mentors trainees and junior faculty getting started in clinical research. Dr. Wusthoff. Thanks very much, and thank you everyone for joining us this morning. It's a pleasure to be able to talk with you. For the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about uh, my perspective on how to get involved in research. I don't have any relevant financial disclosures. But here's what I'm going to cover over the next few slides. We'll talk about perceived barriers, and I'll spend some time on this because I think it can be one of the biggest challenges when you're first trying to get started in clinical research. We'll talk about taking first steps. How do you get, get in the door? What's the first thing you should do if you want to get started in clinical research? How to find a mentor? How to identify good clinical research opportunities? And I'll just touch for a moment at the end on funding resources. To give you some background on me, uh, I had a little bit of a roundabout pathway to coming to clinical research. I have an MD, and I did get a master's degree in clinical research, but that was four years after completing my fellowship. So it wasn't a right out of the gate decision that this was what I was going to do. Uh, I spent two years uh, at the end of my training in London working as a neonatal neurologist. And now I'm at Stanford. I was an assistant professor here for six years. Now I'm an associate. But I didn't get my first NIH grant until 2017. Um, I've got two small kids, so I'm particularly mindful of trying to navigate clinical research and keep things going while also doing other things with your life. And I certainly don't have all the answers. I won't pretend that I can lay out for you today exactly what you should do, but I can tell you some of the things that I've learned along the way. And when Adam first asked me to give this talk, I wasn't quite sure why he picked me. And in the most polite way, he told me that it was because I had had a more circuitous pathway in getting to clinical research. And, and in retrospect, I think that's true. Um, I had bounced around quite a bit. My first job in research, the first time I actually did any science, was as an undergraduate when I needed a work-study job. And my TA for one of my classes needed a work-study to take care of her pigeons and her experiments. So that was my first science job at the New York State Psychiatric Institute as an undergrad. Then I went to UCSF for medical school, stayed in the Bay Area to Children's Oakland for pediatrics training, moved a few years after that to Philadelphia to Children's Philadelphia for child neurology and epilepsy training, and got pretty heavily involved in research while I was there. Then I stepped aside for two years and went to the Hammersmith Hospital in London, where I was a neonatal neurologist and did primarily clinical work before coming back to clinical research when I came to Stanford. So a bit of a roundabout path, and I think that there are some missteps and some things that I've learned, some things that went well. So to start out, let's talk about perceived barriers. 
so I've heard some people say that if you're a child neurologist and you're not doing research, it's because you're not really interested or you're not really passionate about it. And I think for most of us, that's not the case. If you take a look at the data from the 2015 workforce survey, when child neurologists asked what parts of your specialty excite you, what do you feel positive about, the things that came up were intellectual challenge, the chance to work in an academic setting, varied practice opportunities and research opportunities. So people want to be engaged with child neurology research. Um, but a lot of people get scared off by this perceived conventional paradigm where the only person who does research successfully is this guy. And this guy started research as an undergraduate, got an MD, PhD, and then before internship identified a revolutionary project that was going to cure disease, apply successfully for NIH funding in the last year of residency, and then smooth sailing from there on, continue to hold multiple NIH grants throughout your career. But that's not really the only way to do clinical research, and I would argue that's not the way most clinical researchers come at their careers. So let's take a look at some of those assumptions. So do you have to have an MD, PhD to do clinical research? Well, you can take a look at some of the numbers for folks who are applying for grants. The K-23 is the Clinical Research Career Development Training Grant from, from NIH, and overall, pediatric neurologists had a success rate of about 43% in applying for those grants. And among MDs, the success rate was 41%. Among MD-PhDs, it was 50%. So a little bit of a difference, but not a huge difference, and certainly not that the only people who are succeeding were MD-PhDs. Uh, should you have funding in your last year of residency? Is it all over if you've made it through residency without getting a grant? Not at all. If you take a look at the average time from the end of a residency to the first career development award, it's 45 months, and that's for dual degree applicants, the MD-PhDs. The funding rate is different from year to year for the K-23 grant, for example. It can vary from 15% to 40%. Um, but most people who are getting these grants are not getting them as soon as they're finished with their clinical training. Never have a gap in NIH funding. I'd heard this from some people when I was in training, that if you start out without a grant, it's too late. If you lose your funding, your career is over. You can't get back into research. Well, similarly, that's not true. There's lots of reasons that people step away from research and come back to it that might have a gap in funding. And there's ways to come back to research really successfully with well-funded, supported research. Uh, one example is that NINDS has diversity and re-entry supplements specifically for scientists who are looking to join in on projects that are active and ongoing at their institution. Maybe you're an early stage investigator who stepped away from research for personal reasons for a couple of years, and you can get extensions to your early stage investigator status. That's helpful when you're applying for funding from NIH. So for example, if you have had children, you can extend your early stage investigator status to reflect that. If you have been caring for a family member, if you've had military service, all really good reasons to prioritize something other than research for a bit, and you can get credit for that when you're applying for with early stage investigator status. And is it true that the only people who can do clinical research are the folks who have multiple NIH grants throughout their whole career? Um, I used to hear things like if you have less than three R01 grants, it's not going to work. Well, it is true that in the past, only 10% of investigators held 40% of the funding, but that's changing. And NIH has a Next Generation Researchers Initiative, which tries to help newcomers in getting that first bit of funding, um, making sure that the projects that are funded are still very high quality, but engaging people who have good ideas who want to get involved. And there's a website listed at the bottom of this slide for folks who want to learn more. I think it's also important to recognize that clinical research in child neurology is changing. This is data from a study that was published in 2004, so it's even more true now, that if you take a look at clinical research in pediatric neurology, the number of publications is increasing, but more importantly, the type of research that people are doing is changing. So if you look back at 1990, there was a lot of case reports, um, not as many studies with analytic design, not as many studies that used statistical support or worked in multidisciplinary teams. 
And when you compare that to 2000, that's really what research is looking like now. Most clinical research does have a multidisciplinary team. Case reports are much less the backbone of child neurology research. And more and more, you have to have sophisticated analytic design and statistical support or special training in that. So what worked in the past is not what works now and what's going to work in the future. Similarly, I think that folks have increasingly started to recognize the importance of diversity, and if you're going to have the best people doing the best science, you have to make sure that everybody is able to participate. And so there are a number of awards that are specifically designed to support folks who are doing this at any level of your career, at any stage. So there are pre-doctoral fellowships for folks who are doing health-related research. There's post-doctoral awards for folks who are specifically doing research in neuroscience. There's faculty development awards for junior faculty who are in their first three years of appointment to help get their careers going. And there's research supplements, again, for folks who want to join in on existing projects. This creates a really nice opportunity to bring in new researchers to the team uh, and to enrich an ongoing project. So if the thing that is daunting is this conventional paradigm, well, it just doesn't really exist anymore. It's certainly not the case that you have to have started your research early and gotten an MD, PhD. Many people do not get their first project going until long after their clinical training, and there can be gaps in the funding. You get creative about how to make it work. I think the reality is that people come to research and maybe come and go from research at different points in their career. And motivation and interest are absolutely important. You have to have those. But they're among many factors and some things we just can't control. Some folks don't have exposure to research until later and they come to it later in a career. Some people take time off for personal reasons. And I think we have to support that. You don't really want to be working at a place where the personal is never given any room to exist. So we've got to recognize that there's lots of different ways to come into research and support folks in doing that. PhD training is helpful, and certainly if you have a PhD, you should be able to design a study better than somebody who doesn't have a PhD or as much research experience, but it doesn't mean the only people who can do clinical research well are PhDs. For people who do really want to make clinical research a big part of their careers and want formal training in how to do that well, there are increasing options available to help learn the skills and develop the tools that you're going to need. So master's programs are one option. There are also certificate programs through many institutions and online programs. There's lots of ways to get the skill set that you need. It's not the case that you have to identify the field-changing, disease-curing project in your first go. Small projects have value. There have been field-changing, disease-changing discoveries that all started with a small project identifying a certain target for treatment or a certain aspect of a clinical disease. And so those shouldn't be undervalued. Contributions to big projects have value. Multi-center research just couldn't exist with lots of people participating. And even if your center can only contribute those two, three subjects towards the study, when all of us work together, that can be enough to make some good discoveries. There's a lot of different options out there, and, and mentors are great for helping you sort through them. I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. But know that most clinical researchers don't follow that perceived conventional pathway. That's just not reality at this point. So how do you get started? Well, the first steps are to decide what you want to do as you're taking your sort of first wobbly steps into research. What is it that excites you about research? Is it the intellectual challenge? Is there a particular subject that, that grabs you, a particular disease or a particular mechanism? Is it that you want to have a chance to make a lasting difference beyond just the patients you see today, but, but even beyond that? Or are you looking for variety in the type of work you do? Knowing for yourself which of these things is most important is going to help you make choices that reflect that and keep you engaged and excited about doing research. You have to identify how much research you want to do. The first answer folks often give is, uh, I want to do about 50-50. Um, so sometimes it helps to get more concrete. In the next year, how many hours a week are you going to be able to devote to research and do you want to devote to research? In your career, do you want research to be the majority of your time 
Would you be willing to give up seeing patients for most of the time if it gave you more research time? And that leads to the next question of what are you willing to trade off? Because there's lots of exciting things that we can do in our careers as child neurologists. And so even just within the professional realm, there's going to be trade-offs to make room for research. You have to recognize what is it that you're going to let go. Uh, and in life, what are the things, how are you going to keep that balance? If you plan on getting your research started by adding it on on the nights and weekends, what's a realistic and enjoyable way to shape that uh, while still maintaining other parts of your life? Another way to take first steps after you've figured out what it is that's most important to you is to get started with other kinds of scholarly work. And by that I mean things like review articles, case reports, helping folks write book chapters. This isn't research per se, but it's a great way to, great way to get involved in, in a certain field. It's a great way to practice or test drive working with a particular mentor or team to see how good the fit is. And you start to build up some momentum. You learn a lot more about the topic. You get ideas about what kind of research needs to be done. You learn your field. You meet people. So these sorts of other scholarly projects are a wonderful way to get started if there's not an immediate research project that jumps out at you. Another way to identify opportunities is to network. And Go to meetings, go to professional society meetings, go to things at your own institution and tell people what you're interested in, especially for junior folks or folks who are less extroverted. It is sometimes uncomfortable to talk about your interests and to tell people what you want, but that's how you let them know. And listen to other people. When other people are telling you about their work, you can sometimes pick up on ideas of, hey, this could be a good fit, or I know how I could make that uh, come together with this other thing I'm working on. Be open about asking colleagues for introductions. If there's somebody who you would like to meet, tell someone who might be able to help you out. Hey, I think her work is great. Is there any chance that you could introduce us? Go to do some of the meetings, as many of the meetings as you can, Child Neurology Society, American Epilepsy Society, American Clinical Neurophys Society, pediatrics meetings, neurology meetings. Nobody can go to all of them. But if you have the chance to go to one of them, especially if one of them is local to you, that's a great opportunity to see what's going on in the field and to meet folks who are active in research. And try to keep an open mind outside of just child neurology as you're forming these relationships and thinking of project ideas. Because there's a lot of really interesting work being done by folks who aren't necessarily child neurologists, but might have really good opportunities and projects that could fit in child neurology. So for example, people in adult neurology or basic neurosciences who are working on projects that might translate well to child neurology. I work a lot with neonatologists who have an interest in neuroprotection of the neonatal brain, and there's a lot of back and forth between what I do in child neurology and what they do in neonatology. So don't limit yourself to just child neurology and be open, look for other opportunities outside of pediatric neurology per se. So as you're doing that, it can be really helpful to find a mentor to help you identify those scholarly activities and to make those introductions. And again, some people have their ideal mentor at their own institution. They have their personal Yoda there for them. But if you don't, if you don't have an obvious mentor, there are ways to come at it. Again, networking. It doesn't necessarily have to be that all of your mentors or your primary mentor is at your own institution. It's convenient, but there might be somebody else who's local to you who is a really good fit. You might be able to meet people who have very similar interests to you, even if they're further away. That could be a good mentorship relationship. And as you think about who would be a good mentor, there's lots of things to consider. You want someone with the expertise who knows about the topic or, or the type of work you want to do. You need a mentor who's interested uh, and available. If they don't have the time or the interest, it's, it's going to be limited uh, benefit. And frankly, reputation, that can be helpful. It's not always the case that all four of those things come together in a single person, and particularly in a single person who's geographically right next to you. Um, and then on top of that, you have to have a good personality fit. Some people just mesh better than others. So 
many uh, trainees and junior researchers find that it's helpful to put together a mentoring team. And this can be formal or informal, but you might find that there's somebody who's really helpful for a specific technical aspect of the work that you need to learn, and a different person who has experience in doing multi-center research, maybe a different person who can help you with writing, who can guide you through that, uh, or any other aspect of career development. That's a good way to fill all of these gaps to help get what you need to get going, even if there's not one single ideal mentor available to you, is to put together a team of mentors. So now you've, you've got an idea of how you're going to get started, look for a mentor. So what, how do you get that first project going? Where do you look for these opportunities? Uh, first, Focus your ideas into discrete steps. If you have a study that you want to launch or if you have a hypothesis that you want to test, work with your mentor to make sure that you're breaking it up into parts that are feasible within the timeline you have available. And consider divide and conquer. Work with other people who can, might be able to work on other parts of the same idea to get it done efficiently. Um, a common misstep is to overestimate what you can get done within a certain amount of time um, and then end up at the end of your timeline without having actually completed any of your goals. So certainly feasibility is key when you're getting started. A great way to keep work ongoing and to keep it feasible is to make a contribution to an ongoing project. And again, this is where mentors come in, um, is to help figure out how you can pitch in on something that's already gotten started. Registry data is a nice way to make a contribution, particularly if you are the investigator at your site and you don't have another ongoing project to work with. There are lots of multi-center registries where you can contribute some patients. It keeps you engaged in the field, engaged in research, and then you end up with a nice data set that's open for doing things like secondary studies or ancillary studies um, where everybody can learn as much as possible from the data that's been collected from those patients. Look to collaborate outside your specialty. You might be the only pediatric neurologist at your institution who's interested in research, but perhaps, again, there's a pediatrician, an adult neurologist, a neonatologist, somebody else who's also interested, and that's a great way to form a, a team of collaborators. And again, multi-center studies. It's a wonderful way to get started because it has all the benefits of being able to know you're making a contribution that matters to contribute to a project that will get done, and you also form some nice relationships. Two examples of those that I'll just pick out, the Pediatric Epilepsy Research Consortium uh, was founded eight years ago now, and this was out of a recognition that, you know, in pediatric oncology, folks came together to do clinical trials because they recognized that each individual cancer was rare enough that no one center was going to be able to do good quality research alone. Pediatric epilepsy is a lot like that. To do the best research possible, we got to bring people together to do large-scale clinical trials. The first project that came out of this consortium uh, looked at infantile spasms and collected several hundred patients with infantile spasms, and since then has expanded to include interest groups for early life epilepsy, ESIS, surgery, and more. And there's really an emphasis in this group on supporting junior investigators. For folks with an interest in epilepsy in particular, their website's at the bottom of the page. This map shows some of the locations of member centers. Another example of a multi-center research consortium, a place to get started, is the CCEMRC. This is the Critical Care EEG Monitoring Research Consortium. This is a great group for folks who are interested in neurocritical care or ICU EEG. It includes both pediatric and adult sites. It's got 27 members. And similarly, it has an ongoing database available where people can contribute patients as they're able from their work. And then you have this lovely data set available to propose projects and to do analysis with. Um, the sites don't have to participate in every project that comes up. You can pick and choose according to your interests and resources. And this is an example of a group that tries to make research integrate well with clinical day-to-day -day work. So their website's at the bottom for folks who want to learn more. Last thing I'll mention briefly is funding, because sometimes you have a great idea, you have a team of people you want to work with, but you got to come up with the resources to make it happen. You could talk for a whole hour on its own about funding, but Think beyond just an NIH grant. These are NIH awards are fantastic, and, and they support a lot of wonderful research. Um, 
but other places to get started can be institutional awards. Many healthcare systems or universities have research funds available, particularly for projects where you need a small start to get pilot data going or feasibility data going. Most of the professional societies, like Child Neurology Society, AES, and AEN have training grants that are designed for people who are getting started with clinical research to help build momentum for projects. NIH has a myriad awards that are available, and those are, are listed on their website. In particular, I'll point out the NIH Loan Repayment Program, which a lot of early stage investigators take advantage of. It's fantastic, and if one of the trade-offs that you're worried about in getting started in clinical research is, I have to pay off all of my loans, how can I shape a career that is compensated lower because it's not a full-time clinical private practice job. Well, NIH loan repayment is fantastic and it supports people who do want to focus on careers with research. So I've used up my time. I'll stop there. The Q&A is available for folks who want to answer to ask questions. Uh, the conclusions, what I'll say is don't quit before you start. There's perceived barriers about who should or can do clinical research, but really it's open to anyone who's got the interest, who's willing to do the work. When you're taking your first steps, think about what you want to do and why you want to do it, and then go after anything you can to get your feet wet, any kind of scholarly project or collaboration. Look for a mentor, but be open to having multiple mentors so that you get all of the help that you need. And when you're looking for a first project to identify opportunities, collaboration is key. Collaboration with other specialties, other investigators, contributing to multi-center research projects. And depending on which one you end up doing, you're gonna find funding opportunities that might support you in training to be a better clinical research, that might support specific projects, or an award to support your career development overall. Uh, so again, Q&A is available to type in any questions that you might have. And at this point, I'll hand the slides back over. Thanks a million, Courtney. That was fantastic. Our next speaker is Dr. Mustafa Sahin, a developmental neurobiologist and child neurologist at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. He is a professor at Harvard Medical School and the Rosamund Stone Zander Chair at Boston Children's Hospital. At Boston Children's, Dr. Sahin is the director of the Translational Research Program and the Translational Neuroscience Center. Dr. Sahin has established and directs the multidisciplinary tuberous sclerosis program. He directs two national consortia to study biomarkers and comparative pathobiology of tuberous sclerosis complex in related neurodevelopmental disorders. Mustafa. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for all of you for calling in. Uh, I'm gonna focus on multi-center studies uh, as an opportunity for any child neurologist to get involved. Um, my background is in neurogenetics, as Adam mentioned. Uh, I want to start with my disclosures uh, because of the work uh, that is translational in nature in both the preclinical and clinical side of my areas of interest. I work with a large number of uh, pharmaceutical and bio biotech companies. They are listed here. What I want to focus on, uh, and the next slide will show an outline of uh, uh, my presentation, is um, different levels of uh, uh, involvement in multi-center studies, uh, starting from relatively um, low burden, relatively easy referrals to uh, higher uh, involvement in investigator-initiated clinical trials. And then for the second half, I'm gonna give you some examples of uh, the type of uh, multi-center consortia that I've participated in and how some of my colleagues that I work with have participated uh, during different uh, stages of their careers. Before I start, I wanted to share with you uh, my perspective on clinical research in pediatric neurology. And I have to say, over the last 20 years of being a child neurologist, that has changed over time. Uh, as you know, advances in genetics and neuroscience and drug delivery has changed child neurology dramatically. And uh, child neurology is going through a transformation from observation and diagnosis based practice to more intervention and therapy based practice. And that's obviously what the families that we take care of uh, want. Uh, that's exactly what the NIH uh, and funding agencies want. That's what the industry uh, wants. So I think we're all aligned toward bringing more therapies to more children with more neurological disorders. Uh, advances that we've seen in terms of FDA approval of uh, 
uh, drugs in spinal muscular atrophy, tuberous sclerosis over the last uh, several years are just tip of the iceberg, and there's going to be many more clinical trials uh, that are happening right now, and there's going to be happening in the future. In my mind, child neurologists are best equipped, equipped to uh, advocate for their patients and lead these uh, uh, clinical uh, studies. So in that sense, this is a huge opportunity. Uh, some may say it's, a, it's also a huge responsibility. So I wanted to sort of share with you uh, some of the opportunities that we have at different levels uh, to get involved in that transformation that's happening in child neurology. So obviously the easiest way to get involved, uh, just straight from your clinical practice uh, to be able to uh, um, uh, get involved in research is to refer a patient that you see in your practice to an ongoing clinical trial. And uh, many of you are familiar with this, but I wanted to highlight it again. There's a website called clinicaltrials.gov that is an amazing resource for all actively recruiting uh, clinical trials. You can type in the disease of your interest. I, uh, as an example, I put in tuberous sclerosis. Uh, 16, 63 studies came up. Some of them are, are active uh, but not recruiting yet. Others are completed. Uh, but some of them are recruiting, so you can actually click on that link and find a um, center near you to refer patients. And I think that's uh, the, the sort of minimal effort uh, involvement in research. Um, other ways of getting involved is to join an existing uh, consortium. As, as Courtney mentioned, there are many uh, consortia focused on child neurological diseases. Uh, one of the examples I wanted to give is the uh, Rare Diseases Network. Um, this is a, 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 a group of consortia, nearly 20 consortia that are fin funded by uh, NCATS and other institutes at the uh, NIH, including NINDS. And um, these provide um, infrastructure uh, for uh, clinical uh, studies, either uh, natural history studies or, in some cases, treatment trials um, for uh, many of them in, in, in child neurological diseases. And this would allow you to get familiarity with the regulatory process and, in some cases, build the infrastructure um, for clinical research in, in child neurology. Another way to get involved is to uh, get involved in um, industry-sponsored clinical trials. Uh, in fact, that's the first uh, clinical trial that I was involved in. It was a, a pharmaceutical company, Novartis, uh, initiated trial. Uh, it, it was testing. Uh, RAD001, now known as Everolimus, in the treatment of patients with tuberculosis and subavimidin of giant cell astrocytomas. It was a large study um, with 99 patients uh, with 25 sites internationally. And we only enrolled two patients at my site at Boston Children's. And this study overall led to FDA approval of Everolimus for subavimidin of giant cell astrocytomas. But for me personally, it also led to further development of our clinical uh, research program in tuberous sclerosis. So we went from predominantly being a, a clinical care clinic at Boston Children's to being a clinical care and research program. And that has now evolved over the last 10 years, since 2009, into several trials, which I'll, I'll mention briefly as we go along. So even though you may start with a relatively uh, small involvement in a multi-center industry-sponsored trial, that can give you um, uh, some experience and infrastructure to be able to take um, larger uh, roles in other trials going forward. So industry-sponsored uh, trials uh, are relatively easy because the industry, industry uh, does most of the work in terms of the regulatory aspects of the trial, uh, finding the, obviously the funding, but the drug, and uh, even in some cases, um, clinical research organizations or CROs that can help you do the, do the study. Uh, so the burden on the investigator is relatively low. But then you can also have investigator-initiated trials. And in this case, the investigator is, really takes the full burden of finding the funding, finding the uh, reagents, the, the, the drugs that will be tested, uh, getting all the uh, regulatory pieces uh, together, including approval from the FDA to do this trial. So in this case, um, uh, I launched um, together with uh, my colleague Darcy Kruger at Cincinnati, uh, a phase two trial of the same drug, Everolimus, uh, in patients with tuberculosis, but looking at neurocognition. Uh, this was a trial that enrolled 47 patients from the two sites. Uh, it was 
we raised the funding ourselves uh, from a pharmaceutical company, Novartis, who made the drug, uh, Autism Speaks, and Tuberous Sclerosis Alliance, the main uh, patient advocacy organization for tuberous sclerosis. Uh, it involved uh, getting a new IND, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But I, I want to highlight that this whole uh, in the investigation initiated trial process really has uh, significant regulatory uh, and administrative needs uh, in terms of communicating with the FDA, uh, with the uh, pharmaceutical company, IRB, uh, requirement for study monitoring and adherence. So it's a, it's a significantly larger burden. Uh, for, for instance, the FDA, uh, from the FDA perspective, uh, if you initiate a trial with a uh, new uh, drug, you have to file an investigational uh, new drug application or IND application. Uh, and this is required for any experiment with a drug that has not been uh, uh, approved uh, to be marketed for that purpose. So uh, in this case, uh, I, I uh, wrote an IND application uh, which went to the FDA and had to get, a, get approval for this study. Uh, in some cases, the uh, IND may be held by the uh, industry partner, which uh, obviously reduces your burden. But in the cases where you hold IND, the, the regulatory and administrative burdens are, are significant. So this, uh, just to uh, uh, cover the, the full um, arc of the study, uh, we've actually finished that study and we published it in uh, Annals of Clinical and Translational Neurology uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, Darcy Kruger, again, uh, uh, was my co-PI. He's the first author of the study. He's the Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Um, I want to turn to now to the multi-site uh, consortia that I've been involved in. This, this study, as I mentioned, was just two sites. But uh, as we uh, get deeper into, especially in uh, childhood neurogenetic disorders, uh, we realize that we need large cohorts uh, of uh, patients to be able to understand the natural history of these diseases better and to be able to uh, test uh, interventions. Uh, uh, in a larger uh, set of patients that will actually have enough power to be able to tell us whether that, that study is safe and, and that drug is safe and efficacious. So many of the diseases we take care of, obviously, as child neurologists are rare disorders, and they require multi-site uh, consortia to be formed. Uh, and in terms of these consortia, you can play different types of roles. You can be the overall principal investigator of the study, and that obviously comes with a lot of um, organizational, administrative, and regulatory responsibilities. But you could also be a site PI, just the PI of the study at your center. Uh, and you would work with the overall principal investigator. Uh, and then you could also be a sub-investigator. And in many cases, I would recommend that if you're just starting off, um, that uh, you learn uh, the necessary steps by being a sub-investigator uh, under the site PI and really learn how to um, uh, uh, be familiar with the, each of the steps of uh, going through a IRB approval, how to launch a study, how to coordinate uh, data entry and analysis with the other sites, et cetera, by being a sub-investigator. I want to um, mention one study that we uh, initiated back in 2012. It's the Autism Center of Excellence Research Network, uh, again funded by the NIH, uh, focused on tuberous sclerosis. In this case, uh, we have five centers uh, that all have large uh, tuberous sclerosis clinics, and our goal was to collect uh, newborns uh, uh, diagnosed with tuberous sclerosis early in, in life and do uh, identical um, phenotyping using psychological EEG and, and MR imaging um, on these individuals so that we could look at the natural history of uh, autism in this population and look for biomarkers that go along with the uh, diagnosis of autism. So this was a uh, very large study. We collected 160 patients over five years, and we have a very large data set of MRI, EEG, and neuropsychological testing, and many um, sub-studies are now ongoing to analyze this data. I'll give you examples of um, uh, three papers that have come up so far. Uh, the first paper uh, was led by uh, uh, Peter Davis, who is a child neurologist here at Boston Children's. He actually did his training here uh, in child neurology residency and then stayed as a behavioral neurology fellow and now is an instructor in neurology. He looked at what are the um, presenting uh, symptoms uh, that lead to diagnosis of tuberous sclerosis 
in infants in 2000 and um, in this case, I guess 2017. And he looked at all 160 patients and what were the earliest uh, signs that led to an investigation uh, around uh, this diagnosis and what was the confirmatory uh, findings at the time. Um, another paper uh, was led by Sid Sirvastava. Uh, he's a NDD, Neurodevelopmental Disorder Trained Child Neurologist. Uh, he came to us, uh, came to Boston from uh, Candy Krieger uh, and did a neurogenetics fellowship here. And then uh, he's now an instructor in um, child neurology. He looked at the MRI um, uh, of individuals uh, in infants born with tuberous sclerosis and uh, looked at cerebellar volume in particular as a biomarker of developmental outcome in tuberous sclerosis and showed that there were uh, correlations with um, developmental scores in terms of Mullen uh, in term, uh, with, with, with respect to the cerebellar volume. And then finally, Jimmy uh, Keppel is an assistant professor at Cincinnati, uh, has been working with uh, Darcy Kruger uh, at uh, Cincinnati Children's, and she's been particularly interested in uh, the role of seizures uh, and their effect on early development in tuberous sclerosis, and she's been analyzing this data from that perspective, and, and that led to this paper in epilepsy and behavior. So I, these are just some examples of how you can go from a very large multi-center study with a rich data set and how uh, investigators at, at different points in their career can look at different aspects uh, of analysis using such a, a large data set. Uh, so you can imagine uh, being part of this as a, a site uh, PI or, a, or a, even a sub-investigator can lead to really uh, important uh, steps in your career in terms of having access to this kind of data already collected for you, and but also learning uh, how to analyze this data and present it. I want to um, summarize here um, from my perspective as a, as a child neurologist and neuro neurogenetics uh, researcher, uh, advances, advances in genetics and, and neuroscience and uh, drug delivery are leading to many clinical trials in rare diseases that we see in, in, in child neurology clinics, uh, spinal muscular atrophy, tuberous sclerosis, wet syndrome are just some of the examples, and there's going to be many more to come. Uh, so there are opportunities for child neurologists to contribute at different levels, uh, starting you know, very basically from referring patients to ongoing studies to actually initiating uh, investigator-initiated trials uh, themselves. And then for uh, trials in rare diseases to succeed, uh, we obviously need the involvement of large number of child neurologists, large number of sites, and large number of um, uh, actual practitioners to take part in these trials. So the more we get engaged, the more we'll be able to advocate for our patients and uh, contribute to uh, uh, mechanism-based treatments for uh, more of our patients. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thanks a million, Mustafa. That was great. Thanks to both of you for um, <clears throat> really thought-provoking and uh, educational presentations. So um, I'll go ahead and start off the questions and ask each of you um, to answer this one. So you, Mustafa mentioned the importance of um, industry trials. So how would you actually, um, what are the mechanics of actually getting involved in industry trials, either as a site PI or in another role, such as a DSMB member or a safety monitor? Because there are other ways to sort of put your toe in the water. So how would each of you um, think about the actual mechanics of that? Courtney, go ahead. Um, so I would say that Again, from in my experience, this has come from talking to other people who are, are interested in similar areas. The industry-sponsored trials that we've been doing here have either come about from someone else at another institution who's getting involved who says, hey, is this something you'd be interested in and, and makes the introduction, or from a sponsor reaching out and saying that, that I know that you have done work in this field. Is this a project you'd be interested in? So for the industry-sponsored trials, it, it been largely word of mouth and, and people helping to get the right people together to do those um, for studies where I'm the, the site lead. Um, for DSMB work, that's a, a point that we didn't talk about. So data safety monitoring boards are, are groups of 
uh, folks who are independent of the researchers themselves, the investigators on a project, but contribute to the project's success by um, helping to monitor how things are going, make sure that there's no safety concerns and that um, things are at checkpoints are going well. Um, the ones that I've been involved in, again, have been <laughs> through invitation, um, and often it, it'll be something like a trial that sounds really exciting, but for whatever reason isn't a good fit for our site to participate in by enrolling patients, then that's another way that we can still be involved in it is, is by an individual serving on the DSMB. So I have two things to add to uh, what Courtney mentioned. Uh, one is um, we did not talk about this as much, but patient advocacy groups these days are extremely uh, crucial for clinical studies and clinical trials uh, in many of the diseases that we, we, we take care of. Uh, so being uh, engaged with the patient advocacy organizations and um, uh, getting access to their network, and many of those patient advocacy organizations uh, connect with industry partners so that are working on that disease. So that might allow you to, uh, your name to come up uh, in case the, an instant industry partner is thinking of uh, starting a trial in your, in your area, uh, disease area. So I would suggest getting involved with the patient advocacy organizations are really important um, first step in terms of your networking. Uh, the other thing we did not talk as much about is um, uh, being involved in clinical research as a, as a reviewer. Uh, you know, there are opportunities for many of these applications to be reviewed at the NIH or other patient advocacy organizations or other uh, platforms. And I think we need more child neurologists to volunteer to be reviewers. Uh, we need child neurology studies to be reviewed by child neurologists. So I would encourage people to think about that as well. Thank you both. So let me ask a follow-up question. In terms of the mechanics, we talk about people who you know, um, but what if you're in, a, a say, a smaller institution where maybe your mentors might not have some of those contacts? How effective are things like um, talking to people at booths at conferences um, as opposed to cold calls? This is for um, either Courtney or Ms. Stauffer, both of you. So I would say that it, at different points in my career, I've been at um, less research intensive settings. Um, certainly when I was in London, I was the only neurologist at my hospital. Um, and cold calls sometimes work, um, but it depends on who you're trying to contact. Um, and I think most of us can imagine that when you get an email that shows up in your inbox from somebody who you've never heard of, um, it's always a little bit hard to even know, is this a real person? What's going on? Um, so if there's any kind of a connection that you can make otherwise, I, I have found that helpful. Um, I think that in person is always nice because it's it's a way to make a connection, a, a face with a name, and, and introducing yourself to someone after they give a talk, or at a booth, or uh, at their poster at a meeting is is a nice way to do that. I I totally agree with the patient advocacy um, groups. That's a really important important point is that sometimes you volunteer to give a talk to a parent group, um, and that's a way to start to meet other people who are interested in the area, that your other speakers who might be at the event um, or the parent advocacy group can help you um, in that way directly. So um, those have been the things that I, I have tried more. Um, I have at various points also reached out to people who might not be at my institution anymore, but um, who I have crossed paths with. And I think most of us are all eager to help each other out. So it, it may be that where you are now, you're the only child neurologist, but you probably train someplace where there are other child neurologists or have met other child neurologists or, or have other kinds of colleagues who would be happy to help you out. Yeah, I agree with that completely. But I would not be anxious about, you know, reaching out to people you don't know either. It's a relatively small community, as you know, child neurology, and most people are very nice, and they'll write back eventually. Yeah, and and <clears throat> people know people who know people a lot of times, right. so that right. that can be helpful too. So here's a question that um, someone asked: Can panelists, can you both comment on how uh, the identification of N of one patients with whole genome sequencing? will change the approach to therapy and clinical trials, in particular uh, referring to the recent Batten disease patient who was treated with the ASO, the anti centologo at Boston Children's. So how are N of 1 trials going to change um, entry of investigators into the research landscape? Well, we're actually dealing with that, um, you know, in real time here uh, because after that uh, New England Journal paper, 
uh, uh, many uh, uh, families and patient advocacy groups have been interested in F1 studies. It's obviously, it just shows um, the pace of progress uh, in our field, I believe, and the opportunities that have arisen due to the advances in, in genetics and, and uh, drug delivery. Uh, but at, at the same time, it comes with uh, a lot of uh, uh, ethical, um, economic, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in also importantly, scientific questions that we really don't know the answers to. And there's a lot of work, at least in our institution, trying to uh, come to terms with that. And we formed uh, working groups and committees uh, and doing a lot of thought on that. But that also means, I think, um, that we, First of all, we need better diagnosis, uh, better diagnosis in the sense that more detailed genetic analysis of our patients. In many cases, this is still very, there's still a lot of obstacles to getting whole exome sequencing for our patients. The many patients with, um, you know, epilepsy or cerebral palsy or developmental delay don't get the appropriate workup that they may um, need. Uh, and without that, all this N of one um, therapies will not be available. Uh, and second, once we have a diagnosis, uh, whether that would be amenable to uh, these kind of antisense oligo treatments or um, the newer um, you know, gene therapies that are uh, coming up the pike, uh, I think they're all uh, up for grabs, and we're going to all have to deal with as a child neurology community the implications of these advances that are probably happening faster than we ever imagined. Yeah, I agree. It's it's incredibly exciting um, and also very thorny. Um, the the N of one studies, it's and I would add on to what you said that it's a patient is an N of one, but the research team is an N of one. So um, I hope that this doesn't turn into individuals thinking that they have the burden of trying to to come up with these treatments in isolation, but much more, you know, what, what you were just saying of um, groups of folks who treat rare diseases helping to ensure that there's ways to do the science in a, in a methodologically sound and ethically appropriate way, so that even if it's one particular patient who's getting treated, it's going to take a whole uh, network of people to make that happen and to learn from it. Fantastic. Thank you both. So um, another question that we had, and I'm going to add on to this question, um, so what advice would you give, let's go to the, the, uh, the ends of the spectrum for professional development, what advice would you give to a medical student? And what advice would you give to someone who um, is a pretty senior person who's thinking about um, sort of a, a change in emphasis or possibly making that a part of a, a post-retirement career? Medical student part is easy, I think. Um, I do the recruitment for our res, um, you know, medical school um, and, and residency, and this is such an exciting time in to, to get involved in child neurology um, for a number of reasons, obviously. Uh, diseases we take care of are as fascinating as the ones we were taking care of 20 years ago. But the things we can do for those children are, are so much more numerous and impactful than they used to be. Uh, I think this is a very exciting time, and recruiting into child neurology has, been, has not been easier in my experience than ever before. Uh, and even those individuals in the post-retirement you know, or post-retirement, I think uh, uh, if you are interested, uh, many of these are Many of these te new technologies are, are um, complicated in terms of sort of scientific background, but in terms of actually getting people engaged uh, uh, in terms of finding the next you know, center that is providing that kind of treatment or, or natural history study, I think there's a lot to be, to be done and that you can contribute to. Uh, so feel free to reach out to those people and in terms of either your patients or the patients you used to take care of and the investigators that are um, uh, doing those trials. Yeah, I agree. I think for the medical student, uh, I'm biased, but I would say child neurology is a really great field and getting to try out lots of different things while you're in training is wonderful because even if you learn you don't like that particular thing, you've learned from that experience. Um, so medical students, I, I try to encourage to try many things while they're early in their career. Um, for folks who are more senior who are looking to get back to research or to get started in research, um, I would say that you have a wealth of very hard-won knowledge and experience that some of the younger folks would, would love to tap into. So um, exactly, the, I meet trainees and med students 
who are incredibly intelligent and really skilled with some of the newer, newer technologies and are really hungry to get to meet people who have the clinical experience and know-how. And I think that partnering up with somebody who's senior, who maybe even isn't seeing patients full-time anymore, um, would be a really nice compliment to learn from that clinical experience, to learn from some of, again, the relationships that that person has and their awareness of other folks who are working in the field, um, because then you've paired together two skill sets really nicely. That's great. So um, I think we have time for one last question that I'll put out for um, for both of you, and, and feel free to um, uh, add what you think. So um, what if you're starting out primarily in a clinical position and you want to add clinical research at some point down the road? You either know that you're going to add it or uh, that you want to add it or um, you discover after a few years of clinical practice that, you've, um, that you'd like to do this. So how would you counsel someone who is negotiating a first contract who thinks they may want to do it down the road? How would you counsel them if they've already been in for a short amount of time and then want to negotiate that? or third, someone who's actually mid-career and realizes that this is a new interest for them? Um, <laughs> I think for the person who's negotiating a contract, um, the things that are really helpful um, in creating a space for you to, to do clinical research is to demonstrate that you have a plan and to, to show some sort of a track record. Um, and if you're very first getting started, um, it might not be a realistic expectation to say that you have led a clinical research project or that you have completed one, but even having a track record to show I'm interested in disease X, and I've demonstrated that interest by working in this clinical setting, by working with this patient advocacy group, by doing this case report, these review articles, to, to show that this is not just an idea, but it's something that you've put some time into and that you've built momentum in, um, and mapping out a clear plan. It's, it's hard to negotiate a contract um, if you say, I want to do research, um, and don't really have a plan more than that. It's much more convincing if you say, I want to be the site investigator for multi-center trials in this disease. These are the things that I need to get me there, whether it's a particular type of training, whether it's to have a, a certain number of hours a week of a clinical research assistant, um, or a certain number of hours of your job that are going to be protected to do research. Um, and this is why I need those things to reach that goal. So I think for any stage of, of contract negotiations, the, the way to create space for clinical research in the future is to demonstrate that this is something that you're serious about, that you have a, a track record of getting things done, and then to show that you have a plan going forward and, and what you need to achieve that plan. Yeah, that's a very thoughtful answer. I, I, the only thing I would, I guess, underline is, is the uh, think about the time because that's the rarest uh, of the values that, uh, that we end up having as a child neurologist, I think, and consider um, uh, how much time you can get protected if you're going to uh, do research. And what I see a lot uh, in junior faculty is to focus on you know, all the things that they want to do in the clinic and seeing more patients uh, and, and you know, level of salary support, et cetera, but don't spend enough time thinking about the time component and, and how they're going to get everything done and you know, take care of the family responsibilities, et cetera. So it's, a, it's an important um, uh, equation to keep in mind while you're negotiating. Well, thanks a million to both of you. Thanks to everyone who, uh, who listened in today. Just as a reminder, the session is being recorded and is going to be transcribed and archived on the NINDS website, and we'll be releasing details about where you can find that on both social media and amongst professional societies. So thanks again to both Drs. Wusthoff and Sahin, and uh, it was fantastic. Hopefully you guys will have a great week, and thank you for participating in the first webinar of this series. We already have some additional speakers lined up. Um, hopefully we'll be doing this quarterly. Thanks again to everyone. Have a great week. Thank you.